Right. Good morning, Transform. So, God, we just turn this service over to you again. We just continue to keep turning this service. We thank you for the great worship. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, again, everything said and done, bringing you and you alone honor and glory. Holy Spirit, we pray that each one of us would leave here different. Every one of us would leave here changed and touched. In your name we pray. Amen. So, uh, Pastor Ken asked if I would share my testimony this morning. So, we've already done however many services now. So, if I just had a quick raise of the hands, how many people have never heard my testimony? Don't anything about it. Raise them up. Okay, so quite a few. So in 2006, I was working on a semi truck. I owned a business where I did on site diesel repair, and it was a great big Peterbilt logging truck. And the guy who, who owned the, the guy who owned this company, I was like an hour south of my home, and the guy had, had a mechanic that worked for him. And so I just traveled around like a, with a big service truck. So one day I might be working on the roof of a hospital on a big diesel generator. The, night, the next day I might be working on a piece of the construction equipment, whatever. I just traveled around this particular day in 2006. I was working on a great big Peterbilt logging truck, as big of a semi truck as you're going to see anywhere. It's jacked up in the front, and the front wheels, one of the front wheels is off so we could get to the engine because I was an engine specialist. So I started on Tuesday, worked it on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday night came. We started up to test the repair and make sure it's no longer leaking because I, I was calling because it was leaking antifreeze, leaking coolant. So we get all done. I'm putting my tools away, and I tell the guy, start it up so it's running. And I'm like literally like a couple minutes from walking out the door, and the guy comes up, taps me on the shoulder, says, hey, before you go, could you look at one more thing for me? And I said, sure, what is it? He said, well, I got a big dirty spot on the engine. And he said, I know it must be seeping oil out of somewhere. And he said, I can wipe that dirty spot. It's a big Caterpillar engine, so it's a yellow engine. And he said, there's this big black dirty spot, and I can wipe it off. But within a couple of days, you know, a couple of weeks, whatever, it comes back. He said, but I can't see where it's coming from. It doesn't drip on the ground. I don't have to add oil. He said, so I need you to diagnose it. Can you do that? I said, yeah. And he said, I'll, I'll invite you back at a later time, order the parts, come back and fix it another day. Or maybe he said, you can tell me what to do and I can do it myself. I said, sure. Where is it? He said, in the front of the engine towards the bottom. So if you're here today and you've never looked underneath a big semi truck, picture this. If you were to get on your knees and look underneath the front bumper, big chrome bumper in the front, get on your knees and look underneath the bumper towards the back, what you'd see is the lowest thing to the ground is the front axle. And the reason why is because on big semi trucks, the front axle is a dropped axle configuration. All that means is this. Picture your two front wheels that move when you turn your steering wheel, right? Out of those wheels, the axle connects and drops down. And it goes from the left side of the truck to the right side of the truck. This big axle on, on this truck carried 10 to 12,000 pounds of weight empty. So five to six tons of weight just on the two front tires with the truck sitting there empty. Leonard had jacked up the guy that was working there. He had jacked up that axle on the passenger side and removed that passenger side front wheel. So I look underneath the truck. I see that he's got it jacked up. It had actually been on the jack for three days. The truck had been running 15 to 20 minutes. I'm like, you know, minutes from walking out the door. And I get on his creeper. It was a junky little, like, plastic, do-it-yourself, home-style creeper, right? And I remember looking at it and not thinking I didn't want to get on it because it's, you know, they've got these little wheels and a creeper thing, that mechan a tool that mechanics use to go underneath vehicles. And a good creeper has got big wheels. So, you know, I mean, they're easy to manipulate. But this, and I looked at it and I didn't want to get on it, but thank God I did. And I didn't get my expensive creeper off my truck. So I get on his creeper. I lay on it on your back, right? Lay on my back. I go just barely fit underneath the front bumper, go underneath the truck. And that axle is now where I happen to stop to look at the bottom of the engine. The axle is right over my, like an inch above my belly button. Like, because the axle is like this wide front to back. It's like that tall, shaped like an I-beam. Goes from the, the right side all the way to the left side. And it's just like an inch above me. Like I could just barely fit underneath this thing. And I'm looking at the bottom engine. I said to him, go ahead and shut the engine off. He gets inside the truck to shut the engine off. Unfortunately, when Leonard had jacked it up, he had not used any safety equipment. No jack stands or blocking. It was just the jack, right? And I saw it, and I knew it, and I shouldn't have gone underneath it, but it was like, I'm just getting ready to leave. I mean, I just, I just did anyway, right? I knew better, but I went underneath there. So I go underneath. He gets in the truck. The truck shifts when it did. Now, again, this, it's been on this jack for three days. It's been running for 20 minutes. But when he got in the truck, it shifted just enough, and that jack shot out, and that axle came to the cement and crashed to the cement. So 10 to 12,000 pounds of weight, right? Five to six tons of weight, slams to the cement, and the only thing between it and cement was me. And on impact, it just it's like a blunt guillotine. It crushes my body in half. Blood shot up out of my body, out of my mouth, and a blob of blood landed next to my head. It was like this crazy huge kabang when this thing hits the cement. Well, on, I'm underneath the truck. The driver's side wheel is still on. The passenger side wheel is off. I'm in the middle of the truck. And where the axle is on the cement is like right here. 
and it's going through me, and it comes up at an angle to this side, right? So it comes, and this blood gets like on impact, this blob of blood, and I saw the blood, and I said, Lord Jesus, help me. And I remember saying it twice, just in case he didn't hear me the first time. Lord Jesus, help me, right? And I looked down at this point, and this is what I saw. The axle had fallen through my body. I can't see the lower half of my body. I can only see from, like, my ribs up. And there's about one inch of space between the bottom of the axle and the cement right here. So I know my body is one inch thick. The creeper was plastic, and it was hollow, and it just collapsed to nothing, like eighth inch thick. It was like nothing there. It just collapses. So my body is about one inch thick here. I look to the right side, and I'm about two inches thick. I was thinner than my spine because my L4 and L5 vertebrae were broken, the width of the axle. So if you look down at your own body and just picture yourself thinner, just a little bit thinner than your spine. According to the radiology report, my vertebrae were uh, spider cracked and slightly D-shaped. So in other words, the, the truck falls, the axle falls, and it just did this to the, just, just to that spot and stop because that's where it hit the cement. So it's coming up at an angle, just that little bit of space. The pain, I can't even describe. I'd spent time in the hospital. I'd spent... Uh, like two and a half, three months as a kid in the hospital from traction. Had a, a mishap with a horse. I spent that whole summer vacation in traction back in the days when they used to do traction. And I raced motorcycles for 10 years, and I had broke bones and did different stuff, but I never felt any kind of pain like this. This was crazy, right? I had a cocaine overdose at 21 that should have killed me. That I mean, it, again, nothing compared to this kind of pain. And, uh, you know, the guy gets out of the truck, and he goes into shock. He totally wanted to shock, and he froze, and he's just looking at me from back here, and I'm looking back at him, and he's looking at me, and he's not moving, and I go, call 911, please. And he's, like, not moving. He he's froze because I can see the look in his eyes. It's guilt because he had jacked up the truck and not used any safety equipment, and he just was in shock. And he's just, look, all we could see, all I could see, all he could see from back here is the top half of my body from ribs up, right, because that thing is so tall, and it falls through me. I couldn't see the the bottom half of my body. So I'm looking at him and he's not doing anything. And it seemed like forever. I'm sure it wasn't. He, get, he shakes it off. He calls. I see him screaming on the phone. Truck found somebody. They're crushing half. You need a son, you know, whatever. And, and so he gets off the phone and the engine was still running. He'd never shut it off. So this big vibrating diesel engine is just like right above my head. It's not going to hurt me. You know, it's not going to hurt me because it's, it's this, it's right here. It's not going to fall any further. But the problem is big diesel engines vibrate. And this thing's got falling me through me, and it's got my vertebrae broken. It's got me crushed in half. So it's like an electric bread knife as it's vibrant and just sawing me in half. So I'm saying, shut it off, shut it off, shut it off, shut it off. So he gets in the truck. He shuts it off. He comes back down. He can't put the jack back underneath the axle because the axle's on the ground. So he's trying to figure out how's he going to get it off of me. So I'm looking over there, and he's looking. You know, we're looking at each other. The jack had flown out and stuck in the wall. I mean, it flew out so hard it blew, like, into the wall. So, I mean, he's trying to figure out, and there's a big leaf spring on each side of the truck for suspension. And the big axle goes between them. And so all he could do is he puts the jack underneath the leaf spring, which is a problem because leaf springs are shaped like this. It's a big curve. You don't want to jack up something on a curve because the jack's just going to slip, right? So I'm looking at him where he puts the jack in the front under that leaf spring, and I'm saying, no, J Leonard, no, don't jack it up there. And he says, it's the only place I got. And he's jacking up a little bottle jack, a 20-ton capacity bottle jack, and he's jacking up. And saying, no, no, no. And I'm begging him not to jack it up there, but it's the only spot he's got. So he's jacking it up, and I'm watching it, and it's slipping, and it can't catch it. And finally it catches because there was a bracket about halfway up the arc of that spring, a little U-bracket. And the edge of that jack, which is about the size of a silver dollar, I guess here, loony, right, or whatever, it's like about this big, and it catches on the end of that bracket. I mean, it's just barely touching. It catches, and he starts jacking it up. So he jacks it up off me, and it's just like all this weight is here, and the axle is jacked the the uh, leaf spring is like this, right? And I'm going, no, no, no. And he's jacking it up. And I'm just, I know it's just going to shoot out. It's going to fall on me again, right? And so it's going up, it's going up. And he gets it up off me. And once he got it up off my body, I look down and this is what I saw. My work uniform with the name of my company and my name, right? All that comes to the edge of my ribs. It goes down. My work uniform goes down. And I'm, I got this huge flat spot all the way here. And at my pelvic, it comes back up. And it's like, I see myself. I'm like an inch thick. I'm two inches thick. I'm flat all the way across the middle. And when I looked at myself, it was so surreal. That, and I know this sounds strange in this kind of incident, but all I could think was, it looks like something off a cartoon. It was cartoonish. That's all I could think. This is cartoonish. Like, and I know I'm dating myself here, but Wiley Coyote gets run over by Acme truck and has a flat spot. Or the rock lands on and he's flat like a pancake. I mean, right? That's all I could think as I'm looking at my body. But the next thought was, you know what? There's no way that I should be able to be alive and look at myself like this. 
I'm dead. I'm a dead. I'm a dead man. There's no way I'm going to live, right? So I'm, I'm panicking. I'm freaking out. And I'm afraid the jacks are going to slip up. So I'm begging him, get me out from underneath the truck. Get me out from underneath the truck. And he's shaking his head, no, because most people are told you don't want to move someone with a back injury. Right? I'm flat like a pancake. So obviously my back is broken. He's like, I'm not touching you, right? I've called 911. I'm not touching you. And I'm begging him, please, it's going to slip. Get me off of this truck. He wouldn't touch me. So I'm stubborn and not too smart sometimes. And this big chrome bumper is back here behind me. And I reach back. And I grab the bottom of that chrome bumper and it took everything I have. when I dragged myself out like this far. And I was going to try and go all the way and like get against the push. But I ran out of steam like right here. So I, I'm about this much of me is now sticking out from underneath the front bumper. The rest of me is underneath the truck. So now if the jack does slip, the bumper is going to cr crush my lungs and my like land the, the, the axle land on my legs, right? So I'm like right here, but it somehow just felt better that I was out from underneath the truck, at least my head, which seems weird, but at least my head was out from underneath the truck, which, you know, whatever. So I'm, I'm like this and I'm feeling I'm getting weaker and weaker. What happened when the truck had fallen on me and I was one inch thick? Now think of your meat, you know, think of everything that's in here, right? Your, your flash, your meat, all the stuff. I'm one inch thick. Anything that was in the middle was completely crushed. So that's mainly right. what's right here on your body is your small intestines. So all my small intestines were damaged. But there's a thing called the superior mesenteric artery that is along the length of your whole small intestine, as well as some other arteries. All those arteries were completely severed. As soon as he, and I was good until he jacked the truck up off me. As soon as he jacked the truck up off me, I was able to free bleed. So within minutes, I'm bleeding to death. Once the truck is off my body, I'm bleeding out. I'm bleeding out five places. In fact, doctors say I'm the only person. I'm just trying to wrap your mind around this. Seven and a half billion people alive today. And doctors say I'm the only person in the entire world ever to be ever that they can ever find that's lived with major arteries severed in five places. They say there's nobody else I can find. There's been a couple studies done. University of Southern California, they did the biggest study on the mortality rate of arteries. They pulled from trauma centers from around the world. And based on that study, uh, John Hopkins did a small one. Mayo Clinic did a small one. But the one, the biggest one is University of Southern California. Based on that study, they compare my case against that study. There's nobody with five. There's nobody with four. I think there was one with three. And it was somebody that got in a car accident right in front of the hospital in France. And they'd like like took them in instantly. See, they say if you have one major artery severed and you can't put a tourniquet on it, stop the bleeding, you got seven, eight, nine, maybe 10 at the most minutes before you bleed out. If there's no, no way to stop it. I had five. So the truck is off me. I'm bleeding out. I'm getting weaker. I'm getting weaker. The first, it's a volunteer fire department because it's in the middle of absolutely nowhere, Wisconsin, right? It's logging area, right? It's all woods and trees. And I mean, it's nowhere. Like the next closest town is 35 minutes away for a very small little town of probably Oh, five, six thousand people, you know, maybe ten thousand. It's a small little town, like thirty-five minutes away, right? So uh the guys, you know, the first guy gets there, he takes one look at me, he takes one look at my flat spot, and the, the this is the first responder, right? Volunteer fire department guy on his way home from work, gets the page, he just happens to be right there. Boom, he pulls in, he takes he's his head, you know, he looks, he sees the flat spot and he begins to dry heap. Uh, 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 like he's gonna throw up. Which scared me because this is the guy that's supposed to come help me, right? This guy's supposed to be like the savior, like the knight in shining armor. And he starts going, uh, uh, and he turns his head around. I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. They sent the sissy boy first, right? So I'm freaking out. He scares me more. And then I hear him get on, whether it was a phone. I don't know if it was a cell phone. I don't know if it was radio. I don't know what. But I heard him say, we need med flight. No local place is going to be able to do anything for this guy. We need med flight. So in Wisconsin. There are two really big trauma centers, one in Madison and one in Milwaukee. And I was two and a half hours by car, if you speed, from Madison. So they send med flight from Madison is where it comes from, right? So they start, people start showing up, showing up. And about this time, I'm just getting weaker, weaker, weaker. And my heart stopped because I bled out. When my heart stopped, when I bled out, it's a pretty good indication that you are dead. When that happened, my spirit left my body and went up the roof of the garage up at about 15 feet. You know, I don't know what the roof in here is. Probably close, something like this, you know, whatever. So, approximately like this. I'm up there in the ceiling watching from above. It might have been just a little bit taller, but I'm, a, I'm up in the ceiling watching the accident scene from above. Now, let me say this. I was having a party in the ceiling. I felt so good. I have never felt so good in my entire life. I mean, I, it, in fact, I think about it sometimes, and it makes me wonder. I mean, I didn't get, I mean, I didn't, I don't want to get help myself, but I wasn't in heaven, right? I was just 15 feet out of this flesh bag and it felt awesome. 
And that's what I'm saying. I mean, it just felt amazing. Like, I, it's like, am I, am I like that deranged? There's something that wrong with me that it felt that good to be out of this thing? You know what I mean? So I'm just up there and just um, felt so good. Like, amazing peace. And I'm just watching down, like watching a movie. And I see, like, you know, the, the guy, he's crying. He's running his fingers through my hair. He's crying. And he's apologizing. He's saying stuff like, I should be the one that's dead, not you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm such an old fool. And I'm just watching him. And I could care less, man. It, did, I didn't, it didn't matter to me at all. And maybe part of the reason is because I didn't realize that that poor slobber under the truck was me. I was so disconnected. I didn't know that was my body. I mean, I could, whatever. I'm just watching it all happen, right? But the crazy thing was this. The supernatural part was this. So Leonard is about six foot one, six foot two. Can I have a six foot one, six foot two volunteer real quick? Real, real quick. Okay, so this guy. So he's going to stand in for Leonard, right? So if you get on your knees, face that crowd, face, the, face them, right? So here's the front of the truck, right? Here's the front of the truck right here, the bumper, right? Just this much of me sticking out right there. The real Bruce is up in the ceiling up there. Leonard is running his fingers through my hair, and he's crying, and he's apologizing, and he's saying sorry, right? Now, I'm up here watching it from above. Leonard didn't look at me. I'm up here watching from above. He doesn't know I'm up here. Don't look at me. So I'm up here watching it all, listening to what he's saying, and I'm just watching. But crazy thing was this. On each side of Leonard was an angel. And their heads, they were on their knees just like he was, on their knees just like he was, but their heads stuck up about two feet taller on their knees. So they had to be about eight feet tall just based off of Leonard's height, right? So their heads are like this. I'm up here, and these are huge angels like this, right? And so in the, in the Bible, angels are mentioned like 300 times, 290 sometimes. Sometimes they have wings. Sometimes they don't have wings. And these angels didn't have wings, but they're super big dudes. I mean, I'm talking, these guys, God has got these guys working out all the time. And it's, it mentions that they have white shining clothing. These guys had white shining robe, robes like it makes any kind of like Tide commercial like, like lame, right? I mean like white shining, shining white clothing, robes. And they're like the one on the, like right up against Leonard on each side. And they had their hands in the middle of my body where I'm flat. Right in that valley, they had their hands right in the middle of that valley. One from the driver's side, you know, and he's leaned over like this. Now they had a belt on their robe, and they had long hair that went all the way to that belt. I never got to see their faces because I'm up there watching from here. Leonard, you got face down. I'm up here, right? And they're, they're all like, just like Leonard, looking down like this. So I never got to see their faces. I don't know what that, but I can tell you this. These particular angels that I saw had long blonde hair with curlets, like ringlet hair. And it, obviously there were men just by their body shape. They had a narrow waist, great big broad shoulders. The robes were made out of a weird material. It looked like it was made out of a like woven rope is the best way I can describe it. Like rope, this big or smaller. The, the robes were thick. You know, they had... It, it struck me. It was a detail that struck me because it's, it seemed odd. I noticed it from above, and I watched, and there was some kind of, there was some kind of like uh, patterns in it, but I can't tell you what the patterns were at all. But they just, they're just like steady like statues. I got their hands in the middle, and I just know, and it, what, the crazy thing is I'm watching from above, and it didn't seem like a big deal. It just was like so normal. Oh, look, those angels are down there to help that guy, you know? And uh, I think, and I've contemplated that many times. I think because in the spirit realm, angels are just natural. Right? I'm in the spirit, so it was just normal. It just seemed normal, right? It wasn't a big deal until I came out of my coma, and, and I'm like, remember, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I saw huge angels, right? And then, like, they had tight robes, and you could see their bulging, like, arms, their biceps, and their back. I mean, they were, like, totally chiseled, and they're just, like, I had their hands, and I'm just watching. I was like, oh, cool, those angels that helped that guy. I'm watching. And they're saying there's two guys standing over here, volunteer for a guy. I remember one guy was in bibs. It's, it's like, redneck Wisconsin, right? And then, so he's standing there, and and they're saying it's too late for that guy, you know. And they're not going to do CPR because I've got this massive chest injury. So it's like they're not going to, there's nothing they can do, right? So they're just watching all the talking and stuff. Well, because it's a volunteer, thanks, Leonard. Appreciate that. Because it's a volunteer fire department, um, you know, great guys, you know, great, great people. But um, they had made a mistake. See, they called MedFlight from Madison, which is, like I say, two and a half hours drive away. But they never called an ambulance. So when the helicopter came, there was no way to get the body from the garage out to the highway, which is however many several hundred yards away, which uh, adjoining highway, because it's all woods. They had to find an open spot for the helicopter, which was the closest highway, which this was on a, a stub road. It was off the road. So they're like, okay, where's the ambulance? Where's the body? Uh, oh, we forgot to call one. I'm up above listening to everything getting said. And I'm listening to them say, oh, uh, and I listened to the two guys saying, oh, we're going to get sued. 
That's what they're saying. That we're going to get sued. We need to call an ambulance. So the helicopter goes back to Madison without me. Then they call an ambulance from a town 35 minutes away who comes to get. And so it's coming. Meanwhile, people are still showing up. People are still showing up. It's like, it's too late anyway. It's not a big deal. It's just too late, right? So this uh, woman comes in the back door of the garage. She comes in the back door of the garage. She was, her and another guy were the last two people to get there. They come up the driver's side of the truck. At this point, you know, I wish I could give you a timeline. It's probably only been, you know, just a, you know, whether it was five minutes, six minutes, eight minutes, 10 minutes, however many minutes I'm, I'm there with no heartbeat, right? Yep, minutes. And she gets down between the angels. And there was a guy, and they had, I was having a hard time breathing right before I passed. I was having a hard time breathing. And so they held my arms up like this. And it somehow made it just a little bit easier, easier for me to breathe. And it's like those guys were there on each side, but, you know, there's nothing. So they're just like, people are just, they're not doing anything. They're all just standing around. I'm watching from up. They're all just standing around. And she comes in and she gets between the guys and she's feeling around. She can't find a pulse. And she's, and, and they're saying, these two guys that are standing there are saying, it's too late. It's too late. We're not going to be able to save them. And, and she's feeling around for a pulse. And she said, what's his name? Leonard is now standing on the driver's side of the truck. And he says, Bruce Fanetta. And I watched the lady and she starts doing this. Bruce Fanetta. Come on, open your eyes. Now, everybody was standing around talking. There was two guys here. There was a couple people back here, a lot of them along the side. And when she starts doing this, open your eyes. They all stopped talking and turned and looked at her like, woo Crazy lady, what are you doing, right? Like, how's that going to work? And they all just stopped. They're all just looking at her, and she's getting louder and louder. And something about that name, Bruce Fanetta, sounded somewhat familiar to me. It's, it's all I can say. I'm serious. That's all I can say. And it was like, it caught my attention is the only way I can really describe it. And I like, like, I feel myself creeping in. I'm creeping in all of a sudden. It's like, and I'm back inside my body from my head. Boom. I open my eyes and here she is. And the first thought that hits me is, oh, blank. I'm the guy underneath the truck. Right. And then it all came back. Oh, that's right. The truck fell on top of me. And then I'm like, oh, this hurts so bad. I feel like a truck's falling on me. It's like, oh, it hurts so bad. Uh, no, 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 no. And I just shut my eyes and shh, my spirit left my body again. And I went right back in the ceiling. And all of a sudden, a tunnel opened up with a bright light on the end of it. And I, next thing I know, I'm in the tunnel. I'm going towards the light, shh, rocking away towards the light. And Miss Persistent, I can hear her back there. She's back there somewhere. I can't see her now, but I can hear her. Push that hat up. Push that. Open your eyes. Shh. I stop suck backwards out of the tunnel, back in like real quick, into my body, boom, open my eyes, here she is. It's like, oh, it hurts again, right? Because it felt so good, right? And then God spoke to me. And so all he said, and I just know that I know that I know that I know it was God. And he said, if you want to live, you're going to have to fight, and it's going to be a hard fight. And he sounded really calm. He wasn't stressed at all, right? If you want to live, you're going to have to fight. It's going to be a hard fight. That's all he said. And I contemplated it quickly and said, no thanks. This hurts too much. See you later. And my, she said every time a pulse would come back, and the only place they could feel a pulse was somewhere on my neck, just lightly. And there was nothing on my arms. They couldn't pick up anything on my arms. Couldn't pick up anywhere else. But when I would come back in, she said my eyes would open. My eyes would open up. She'd feel a light pulse somewhere on my neck. She could, see, and my eyes would move around and look at her. And then when I would leave again, my eyes would close. And she said this time was different. The third time. She said, my eyes didn't close all the way. They only closed halfway, but they quit moving. There was like nothing there. And I leave, and I'm going away in the tunnel, and there she is. Bruce Vanetta, Bruce Vanetta, come back. Open your eyes. And I stopped, and I come back in, and I'm not happy with swimming, right? I mean, I come back in, and here she is, and I'm looking at her, and she, as soon as my eyes came around, she says, mister, you're on the verge of life and death. What do you have to fight for? Do you have a wife? Do you have children? Do you have anything in this world to fight for? I had completely forgot that I was married. I completely forgot that I had four little kids, four like young kids. I forgot. I mean, it never crossed my mind at ever. It never even come to me. And I realized that voice that had said, if you want to live, you're going to have to fight, is speaking through her. And I just instinctively know God is talking through this woman. And it was like a slap in the face. Like you wake up from something, like wake up from a dream. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's right. I, I got to stay here. I, it doesn't matter how much it fight, you know, how much it hurts. I'm going to have to fight. See, I wasn't, I couldn't fight for myself. Hurt too much to fight for me, but I could fight for my wife and I could fight for my four little children, right? So I just said, she's like, don't shut your eyes again. You stay here. Stay here. Fight. You stay here. 
you dig in, you fight, you fight. She kept saying that, right? And she said, I'm not going to be with you in the ambulance. So now the ambulance shows up. She says, you pick something out in the ambulance, keep your eyes open. So then the ambulance made a Adam's friendship. When the helicopter comes back from Madison, it, it's never even landed. They got there. They did a circle. It comes right back, lands at uh, Adam's Friendship, little tiny, small hospital, and they just take me from there back to Madison, right? So what it, when it all turned out, two hours and 40 minutes from the point the truck fell on me until they operated on me, did the emergency operation, two hours and 40 minutes with five arteries completely severed. It's beyond. It doesn't make any sense at all, right? It's only God, but God. It doesn't make sense, but God. So the doctors, I mean, I get there and I'm all crushed and they, the doctor um, gets, this, this guy gets called in from home, the head of the trauma center. And he tells my wife when she got there, when she drove there and she said, I've never seen a body this traumatized. It's a large hospital. Madison's a big hospital, like 5,000 people there a day, right? And he's like, I've never seen a body ever this traumatized and make it. I don't know how he made it here and I don't expect him to live through the hour. There's, I, we're not going to be able to do anything. So my wife and the people from church showed up and they prayed for every half an hour. He said I wasn't going to live an hour, so they decided, okay, if he's not going to live an hour, we'll pray for every, and we'll thank God for every 30 minutes. That's what they said. We'll just thank God for every 30 minutes he's alive, which I can't even imagine doing that for my wife. But so every 30 minutes they thank God, every 30 minutes they thank God, and it went all night long, and the next morning the doctors, all they'd done was rehook the arteries and, like, pinch some of them off, and they, they put in, uh, for those of you medical, they put in uh, – 18 units of blood when I got to the hospital. They put in 18. So in other words, I think the body only holds like six and a half, they said. So in other words, they're just putting in, it's just leaking right out. They're dumping in me, it's just leaking right out. And so at the end, I'm like all pregnant, right? I'm all balled up. Instead of being flat, I'm actually puffed up from the from the uh, swelling and from all the fluids, you know, and it's just leaking out. So they're putting in me. So that night of the, the operation, the, the first initial operation, 18 units of blood, which they said is a just a little under three times what the body even holds. So I leaked out mine plus a couple more, right? The, the, the whole amount of, of blood that the body would hold. So they're putting it in me. They do this emergency surgery, and I'm all, everything's crushed, and they're like, we're not going to save this guy. So they just hook the stuff back up, and um, I'm alive the next morning. My wife's like, are you guys going to do anything or what? You know, like, are you going to finish working on him? Are you going to, I mean, because I'm so all messed up. And they're like, no, we don't expect him to live. He's not going to tolerate the surgery. So about noon, she just guilted him into it. She's like, you got to do something, and they, they just did it, and they started, and they operated me all week, a little bit each day, a little bit each day, a little bit each day. They removed almost all my intestines, so I had this, just this little bit of small intestine left. I'm in the hospital. Uh, I spent the next hosp the year in a hospital. That was in November. I didn't get out until December of the next year, and I'd get out for, I would get out for like two weeks, but then I'd go back in for like three months, and I'd get out for a week, and I'd go back in for another month. And I get out for a couple of days and I go back and it was a complication after complication in and out. I had to learn to read again. I'd learn to write again. I'd learn to walk again. Start out with a walker, went to a cane. And I mean, it was because the, the spinal cord was the, the sheath, the outside was, was just chafed. It never even made it into it. And the doctor said like another 16th of an inch. And there's no way you'd ever would have walked again. It was just like right at the ragged edge to where I had to learn to walk in like nothing wanted to work. But it was like through rehab and all that stuff. And I mean, you, you see me walk around, I can actually play basketball with my kids or mess. I can ride motorcycles and drag a deer out of the woods, whatever I need to do. If I had to take off running, right, if, if a bear was chasing us, I might be in trouble. If, if me and this guy were running and a bear was chasing us, he might get away because my speed isn't what it used to be. I look a little bit awkward trying to run. It just does. It's not natural. Not natural. But I mean, as far as walking around, I'm fine. If that's all good. So I'm in the hospital for that time. This guy gets woken up by God way across the United States in New York. Two mornings row, God says, buy a plane ticket, fly to Wisconsin, pray for that guy, and I'm going to do a creative miracle. See, I'm dying in the hospital, being fed intravenously. They told me I can only keep me alive for a year to year and a half at the most on 100% interest feed, intravenous feeding, uh, parental nutrition. So this guy, it's months into it. One of the pieces that they saved in my intestine, so I had like this much small intestine left. All you adults, if I didn't mention this already, 18 to 20-some feet of small intestine, average. 18 to 20-some feet of small intestine. I had this much. Not enough to live. One of the pieces they tried to save died. That was operation number four. They removed one of those chunks. So I got this little piece. I'm just being fed intravenously. And I go down to like 120 some pounds. If you saw me 120 some pounds, I looked like somebody straight out of concentration camp. Like unrecognizable. My face, different. I mean, everything about me. Like my, my skull, you can see it perfectly. Every bone in my body. So I'm dying. I'm wasting away. I'm mad at God. Can't understand why he sent the angels for me to be miserable and sick. And, uh, you know, I, there was plenty of days, I'm telling you what, there was plenty of days, I was like taking my walker, going to the bathroom, my wife would come and visit me during the day, 
because she had to take care of the kids at night, right? And so whether it's school, she'd get this. She'd put the kids on the bus at like 8, 8 o'clock in the morning, drive two and a half hours to spend an hour or two with me to drive back and be home for when the bus got there. So like she's driving five hours a day just to be with me like an hour or whatever. That's it. That's what I was getting for like that year, right? So there's days she'd be there visiting. I'm in the, I'm in the, I'd go into the, to the bathroom and I'd shut the door and lock myself in the bathroom with my walker and I'd be begging God, God, just let me die. It hurts too much. I'm not going to be the man I used to be. I was like, you know, state champion, A-class um, state champion racer, eight years. I mean, all this active stuff. I'm not going to be that guy anymore. So forget it. I just, it hurts too much. You know, they're, they're going to be disabled the rest of my life. Forget it. I just let me die, please. She's out there praying, God, please let them live. Let them be healed. So what's God going to do, right? One saying die, one saying live. I think I just got outnumbered because a lot more people praying for me to live than just me praying for me to die. So this guy comes to the hospital and he prays for me. And when he did a creative miracle happen and God gave me one half of my intestines back on the spot instantly. What's so cool about it was I was getting CAT scans like every other day. I think I should be like glowing in the dark. Like they're giving me uh, upper GIs and they're giving me x-rays and they're doing these CAT scans like all the time, all the time, all the time. MRIs, all this stuff, all the time, all the time. This guy comes and prays and I get 9 to 11 feet of intestine out of nowhere. So what's so cool is when History Channel did my story, because it's been on like 40-some television shows, over 100 radio shows, and when History Channel did it, they actually tried to disprove it. They put it on a show called Miracles Decoded. They told me the name of the show was Miracles, and we taped it. Oh, we're going to put you on a show called Miracles. We're going to showcase your miracle. And they went all the stuff, and I didn't know it was what Miracles Decoded until they sent me a copy because I begged them right before it aired. I was like, oh, Miracles Decoded? And so they get these experts on there. He couldn't have had an autobot experience because there's no such thing as a spirit. So-and-so, somebody with a bunch of letters behind his name from Yale or Harvard, right? And they get this other guy. Well, he couldn't have seen angels because angels aren't real. That's all a figment of a Christian's silly imagination. They, all these guys, all this isn't real, all this isn't real. But then they get the doctors, world-renowned, Dr. Fumito Ito from Japan, this other guy, and they pull up the CAT scans, and they're looking at him on air, before, afters. And they're standing there going, uh... Well, uh, it's, it's, uh, I guess it's a miracle. All right. We, we serve a God who's still in the miracle business. He is alive and well. He's in the miracle business. If that miracle wouldn't have happened of God sending the angels, I would have died. And the lady who prayed me back to life, get this, two-month-old baby Christian. Two months. You know how it is with baby Christians, how they're really on fire and they believe anything's possible because they really still believe the Bible, right? And they, she hadn't even been to church yet. She hadn't even been to church yet. And I thank God she hadn't even been to church because she might have gone to the wrong church. She was just reading the Bible and she showed up. She's like, well, it says here in John 14, 12, those who believe me do the same things I've been doing. So come back to life. And her step of faith, her step of faith was this. Open your eyes. That's why she was doing that. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. It was her step of faith. But in her head, she's saying, come on, God, you said. Come on, God, you said. This two-month-old, 38-year-old, two-month-old baby Christian, right? And she's persistent. She prays me back three times, man. And I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't happy with her, right? So she's been interviewed a lot of times. She's been interviewed lots of times. Uh, she was only on that volunteer fire department for a very short period of time. And she said she's positive. The only reason why she was even there was that night. Those eight months or six months or whatever she was on the volunteer fire department, she goes, it was, I know, it was just that night for you. So God has a plan for my life. He's got a plan for your life. He doesn't love me any more than he loves you, right? He's got a plan for us. He's got it all worked out. So he sends this guy from New York. This creative miracle happens. All this stuff happens. So this ministry starts, and uh, we've been just going at it and just, you know, speaking nonstop, traveling around. We see God do miracles. It's been a miracle ministry. That's what it, I mean, there's people here tonight that can tell you they were there when, uh, Two different people got out of wheelchairs in this area that we prayed for in the last one a year and a half ago and one just like a little bit ago. I mean, it's, it happens. And we've seen the blind eyes open. We've seen deaf ears open. We've seen God do a lot of cool stuff because he still is who he says he is, right? And he does what he says he's going to do. That's the kind of God we serve. Even the fact of me living 20 years of drugs and alcohol. I was a drug and alcohol guy, man, partying all the time, day after day after day, selling drugs, to have my drugs, started in high school, lived that life. So many friends that ended up dead, DOA, heart attacks, stroke stroking out, whatever, I mean, overdoses, getting shot, drunk driving accidents, that whole life, lived that whole life, all those years, it's a miracle I'm alive, I, my, my cocaine overdose, when that happened at 21, that totally should have killed me, like, I mean, I should have been at that time, God miraculously saved me, I remember as I was slipping into unconsciousness, 
on the front seat of my truck. I remember in the parking lot where I was, geeking out of my mind, I, I called out to God and said, oh, God, please don't let me go to hell. I know I'm dying, but please don't let me go to hell. I deserve to go to hell. I know I'm a sinner. I know what I'm doing is wrong. But, God, please don't let me go to hell. That was like the last thing I remember as I was going unconscious of my, my, my heart attack. I mean, we've got a God who has mercy and grace, and he just kept giving me chances. And you know what? Eight months later, I was right back at it, man. I'm saying, God, don't let me go to hell. But eight months later, I mean, I went through all the stuff with the hospital and all that stuff. But, it, you know, and I, was, I started smoking pot, like, instantly coming out of the hospital. But I stayed away from blow for, like, eight months, which was a miracle. And I was like, and, you know, I was, then I was right back. It's like, you know what? Forget it. What's the matter if I die? What's the matter? I was miserable. I just was like, I was miserable anyway. It's like death could be a blessing, right? And so just living that life, it's a miracle that alone. That God brought me through all that, besides the accident, besides all stuff, and it's a miracle I'm here because I'm the last guy that should be telling anybody about Jesus. There are two people that are dead because of me. There's one of my act because of my actions, one because of my inaction. There's just so much stuff. Like the the family I came from, the I mean the drug and alcohol family I came from, the all of it. I mean, from a, a grandparent, cirrhosis of the liver at 33. Come on, you gotta be pounding liquor pretty hard to die from 33 is supposed to deliver. That's a grandma. I mean, at both sides, mom and dad's both sides. Like this, this family that I came out of, for God to use somebody with my last name because my last name means trouble in my hometown, right? This, all this is a miracle. It's just a statement. I know why he did it. Because people say, why do you think God saved you? Why do you think you're the only one? I know why. Because he, what he's doing, he's setting the bar so low, literally by saving me, he's setting the bar so low. He's saying, look, I'm proving it's mercy and grace. Because if I do it for that knucklehead, I could do it for anybody. That's what it's all about, right? So I get to go around. I get to share. And this, you know, he wanted me to share that, you know, the, the testimony for those of you who didn't hear it. And I saw there's a whole bunch of hands, so I took a lot of time doing that. But I'm just going to give you this abbreviated what I've got here. Because what God really put on my heart for this morning, what God put on my heart, other than the testimony, is this. You know, I mentioned that I get in all kinds of churches. I'm in like every kind of church. So I'm going to give you a, a spectrum of the churches I get in. On this end of the spectrum is mainline denominational churches. Organ church, hymn church, um, high church, theology, theological church, liturgy, high, high liturgy. Um, they're, they're doing re repetitious liturgy. And, you know, mainline, you know, the Catholic, the Lutheran, the Presbyterian, the Episcopalian, uh, the Orthodox, you know. And then, it, and then all the way in the a far end of the spectrum, over here, polar opposite, I get into the charismaniac church, right? Now, this church over here, this church over here, like I mentioned before, this is the church where I'm trying to do the message, and all of a sudden somebody comes dancing by, you know, in my message with the flags going, and I'm trying to speak, I'm trying to speak, and then somebody gets moved by the Spirit, and the shofar goes off. I'm like, okay, just a little, all right, you know, and it's like, you know, the I'm not talking about just in the worship time. I'm talking like in the service, right? Like in the speaking time, right? So that's this then, right? And everywhere in between. Like, and it's like, you know, I don't know where you're from, you know, what, what background, but now place yourself right now. Maybe you came like me. We didn't, you know, my mom was a non-practicing Catholic, uh, pregnant at 15, an illegitimate child herself, given away at birth, illegitimate child, given away to grandma, gets pregnant at 15, Called herself Catholic, but didn't go to Mass. My dad is raised in a Lutheran church. They did go to church, but it was, it was this church, and it was straight religion, no relationship, right? So he's raised in that. They, they, be, they become married, and they become priesters. They go in the priester religion. Who knows what the priester religion is? Only went to church on Christmas and Easter. And, and that was, you know, that was, if somebody, that was if somebody didn't get too drunk first. That's only if somebody wasn't too drunk first. The family I grew up in, it was hardcore drinking, partying, drugs. I mean, that was a family. Mom and dad constantly fighting, physically fighting, um, physically, physical abuse, verbal abuse. I was repeatedly molested as a kid by some babysitters. So I just grew up in this crazy, crazy family, right? So I started the drugs early. And so I grew up in that family. But so what I knew was when we went to church was, was you know, mainline denominational high church. So that was my background. So wherever you're at today, maybe you came like me, you weren't really in church that much. Or when you did go to church, it was just Christmas or Easter. Or maybe you were in church all the time and it was from here. Or maybe it was here. You know, like, because, like, right in here, maybe somewhere in here, they're, they're losing the robe. They're not wearing a robe anymore, but they're still singing hymns, you know, and it's just hymns. And then, like, maybe somewhere in here, they might do a what they call contemporary service. So they got the regular service, 
And then they got a service for the people, contemporary songs, and their praise and worship songs are from 1981. And then, and then like, you know, straight up in here, right in here, they're inviting people forward for prayers on every third Tuesday for Healing Sunday. And, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's just, and it's getting a little more open. It's getting a little more free and it's getting a little more open, a little free and it's getting a little crazier and things, you know, all of a sudden now, now here's the thing, you know, so I get into this church and a lot, and I don't ever get back, invited back to these churches. I'll be honest. I, I go there once. It's a one shot deal. Usually when I get to that church, it's a one shot deal because the Holy Spirit comes with me like, uh-uh, no, that's, that made us uncomfortable, right? Because they're not, it's their culture. It's not, I'm not comfortable with, so there's churches, they, you know, and I'll do, okay, anybody want prayer, come forward. And there'll be 500 people and not one person will come forward. And I'll just tell them, we saw blind eyes open. We've seen deaf ears open. We've seen people, cancer tumors fall off. We've seen God do all that. Anybody want prayer? 500 people. You think somebody needs prayer in there? Yeah. But they're not comfortable coming forward because it's not their church culture. It's not what their normal is, right? So, and you know what? So these people over here, uh, unfortunately, lots of times, they talk about these people over here. And they say, you know what? Those, those crazy charismatics, there's no order. There's no order in that church. They're just out of control. They're out of control. There's no order. They don't have any reverence to God. They don't have any fear for God. And they've got this big, long list. they got these big, long lists, right? Right? And then when I go to these churches over here, they're going, oh, those silly mainline denominational people. We got all the answers over here. They, they've got a little bitty sliver, sliver of the pie. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't have the gifts. They don't have nothing. You know, really, they don't have much at all. And just poor, pitiful little main denominational people. We, let's just try to get them out of that stuff. Let's just try to bring them into our boat because they don't have the answers. We've got all the answers over here. And we're like, no, we don't. We've got all the answers. You don't have the answers. And everybody in between has got this finger that they're pointing at somebody else. And they're saying, you guys don't have the answers. I've got the answers. Let me read you something. John chapter 17, Jesus in verse 6, it says, the heading of my Bible says he prays for his disciples. And you read verse 6 all the way to verse 19, and he's talking about his current disciples right then, 2,000 years ago. He's praying for his disciples 2,000 years ago. He goes through and he prays for them. And then the header at verse 20 says Jesus prays for all believers. And at this point, he changes his focus, and he's no longer praying for the current believers that were there 2,000 years ago. He prays for us today. And this is what he says. My prayer is not for them alone. Now, them alone is the previous however many verses from verse 16 to verse 19, all the current believers. He says, my prayer isn't for them alone, not for you guys that are alive right now, 2,000 years ago for us, right? I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Does that include you and me? We believe in Jesus because of the message that came from our forefathers all the way back to the original disciples. Amen? So he says, my prayer is not for the current disciples, but I pray also for those who believe in me through their message. That's us. Listen, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, time out. Jesus says, may they all be one. May they come to unity. We're going to get to that unity word. May they be one so that the world believes, so the unbelieving world believes that God sent Jesus, okay? So is unity important? Because then the unbelieving world will believe that God sent Jesus. That's one. And then he says, May they also believe in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them, us, the believers, now, right now, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me. So he's just, he's all different ways. He's covering the angle of what it looks to be one, to what it looks to have unity, right? And he's just saying it different ways. And then verse 23, I and them and you and me, may they be brought, listen, may they be brought, who's they? Us in this church today? us, all 108 churches in this valley, right? May they be brought to complete unity. Why? Here's the reason why. To let the world know that you, God the Father, sent me Jesus, and here's the kicker. Check this out. This verse blows my mind. And that God the Father has loved them, unbelievers, people that don't know, has loved them even as much as you have loved me. God, it says right here, check this out. God the Father loves unbelievers and current believers just as much as he, believe, as he loved Jesus. Can you imagine that? God the Father, it says it right there. I just read it to you. God the Father loves us and every person alive just as much as he loved Jesus. And the only way that they're going to know, the people that don't have him already, 
people outside that door. The only way they're going to know is if we come into complete unity. But yet, we're standing over here on this end, and we're going, you know what? Those crazy care max, they don't have order. And then we're standing over here on this end, and they go, oh, they don't have the Holy Spirit, man. They don't know nothing. We got all, we got all the answers over here. We know what's going on. They're lost, man. They don't know nothing. And everybody in between. Oh, drums are of the devil. Guitars of the devil. Uh, organ. Oh, those 500-year-old hymns? Those stink. There is no anointing on those. There ain't no anointing on those, man. They're so old. That's old and dusty. That's crusty. Oh, those new songs? There's no anointing on that. We got to go what our forefathers wrote. And it's all this back and forth. Is that unity? It's not unity at all. And because of that, people look back and they go, why are those crazy Christians fighting all the time? I've got a Someone that's an extended member in the family who said, you know what, this whole thing between the, between the Protestants and the Catholics, and he said growing up as a kid, they'd be getting on the fist fights in the, in the getting, he'd watch other kids get in fist fights on the playground at school between the Protestants and Catholics arguing about religion, right? I just had right here in your area a month ago, a dude want to punch me in the face, be, another Christian, because somebody got out of a wheelchair, somebody else gets out of a wheelchair, somebody else is healed, and he says, it's the spirit of the Antichrist in you. I rebuke the spirit of the Antichrist in you, and I'm just coming against everything you're doing. You're hypnotizing all these people, and he's saying all this stuff right here in your town, right not in this town, but close, in this area, a believer who believes in Jesus, who I believe is going to go to heaven, was so angry he wanted the fist fight. He's shaking, red in the face, wanting to punch me. He actually came at somebody in this church, a believer against another believer. And there's people here that saw it. There, were, there are people here today that saw that happen. You know what? Is God grieved? And then the dude gets, gets, and he leaves, and you know what? He's telling everybody about oh, the bad things that are going on at that place, right? The bad things that are going on. So your background, so I'm just going to throw this out there. Your background, whether you came out of this church or you came out of this church, whether you want to believe it or not, whether you're going to listen to this or not, your background affects the way you think about church today. If you came out of this church, if you came out of this church when the people were jumping and freaking and dancing and having a good time during worship, it made you somewhere inside probably feel a little bit uncomfortable. Even if you've been in this kind of church for years, there's some sliver of you that's somewhere like, oh, you know, you know what? And there's so many people I talk to. It's so often. It's so, I mean, I just see it over and over and over. I've, I've spoken at like a thousand churches, okay? I'm not, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about 20 churches. I'm talking like a thousand churches, right? This end to this end. Everything in between. And I see it and I hear what people say. And it's the things that the it's the things that the pastors and the elders and the people in the seats. It's everybody. It's not just leadership, it's all the people, and it's whatever you're comfortable with. We can't go forward for prayer. If you gotta pray, you gotta have your eyes. If you pray, you have to have your eyes closed and your head bowed and be reverent, right? If you pray, you have to have your hands up. Oh, you're doing it wrong. No, you're doing it wrong. Right? All this disunity and strife. And what happens is people out there don't believe that God sent Jesus because we're fighting. People out there don't see that God loves them as much as he loved Jesus. Because they look at the Christians and go, why would I want that? Right? Why, why would I want that? And you know what it does? We'll be praying along, praying along, praying along. Miracles happen, miracles happen. All of a sudden, an elder or somebody will get in a, you know, there'll be a disagreement. I've seen this. Praying for people. There'll be a disagreement in the front. And guess what happens? <sighs> Anointing drops, miracles quit happening. Holy Spirit's grieved. Over a song. Over who gets to play the next song. Over... Uh, touch them, don't touch them. Let them go on the ground. Let them not go on the ground. Uh, all this crazy stuff. And it grieves the spirit and just he just retracts. He just retracts. And the things just, they just, you know, they slow down. So Jesus is calling us out. Jesus is calling us out and he's saying, if you want these things to happen, you have to be in complete unity. So does that mean everybody's got to convert to your church? Right? Does everybody have to convert to this church? Right? No. Does everybody have to convert to this church? No. Can we realize this? You know what I see? I'll be honest. These people over here, they got some things. Because I'm, I'm me. I'm over here. This is me. Personally, my own personal walk. I'm, I'm somewhere in here, right? These people over here, they've got some things that we don't have over here. They do. If you don't believe it, you're in delusion. They've got some things that we don't have. One thing they have, they have reverence. They truly do, man. I've been into some churches like this over here that the reverence of God is so strong you can cut it with a knife and nobody's dancing and nobody's freaking out and nobody's getting excited and nobody's getting loud and yet the presence of God is so strong you're just like, oh my gosh, it's here, it's real, right? Right here. And to be honest, like, yeah, 
there's some things over here that they don't have over here. But that's cool because we all have a piece of the puzzle. We all got a slice of, we all got a slice of truth. And God raises up all these different ministries. And you look at one ministry, it's a prosperity ministry. Is there truth and prosperity? Absolutely. But if that's all a person focuses on, then they become out of balance, I think. And is it all about healing? Because is it got a healer? Absolutely. Do I love to see people get healed? Absolutely. But is it all about healing? No. There's got to be a balance. Is it all about teaching? No. Yeah, it's, it's teaching, but there's got to be a balance. We have to have this whole balance to have a balanced church. We have a body of Christ, and so God will put up, okay, this ministry, they're going to be the word of faith people. And these guys over here, they're going to be prosperity people. And these guys over here, they got this. And if you're a balanced Christian, you go, I'm going to take from this. I'm going to take from that. I'm going to take from that. I'm not going to diss him. I'm not going to diss him. I'm not going to diss him. And I'm just going to have the whole package, the whole smorgasbord, and I'm going to be like, you see it? That's what it's got to be. But we get in our comfort zone. And we go, you know, the way we do it, we've always done it this way. And if somebody else is doing it different, they must be wrong. They must be wrong. Man, there's so, this is so rich. There's so much here. Um, you know, man, oh, man. We have to understand where we're each coming from. See, because there's, I go to churches and there's doctrinal differences. Just straight up doctrinal differences. They believe different things. You can drop me off, blindfold me, drop me off on the East Coast of the United States. And with about 10 minutes, I can tell you I'm on the East Coast. I just feel it. Not by their accents, but just the way things are done, man. And you drop me off in the Bible Belt, Deep South, and, you know, real quick, I'm going to tell you I'm in the Deep South somewhere. I can feel it. You drop me off on the, on the West Coast. I'm in California preaching. I'm going to tell you, like, in minutes, I'm on the West Coast. I just know it. I feel it. There's a different vibe. There's a different – it's geography. The, the, where I'm from, the Northerners, right? The, the Northern, Wisconsin, Minnesota, you know, Iowa. You know, there's a, there's a certain vibe in those churches. And it's different. Every place. It's all different. And we've got to all come to unity and accept everybody else for who they are and what they've got. So let me just give you a little analogy of what this looks like. Everybody in this church probably knows about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? Gifts of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Well, those nine supernatural gifts of Spirit, those are how you are empowered to do whatever God's called you to do. The gifts of Spirit are how you're empowered to do whatever God's called you. And the church, you know, so the churches over here, they know that. Man, they could read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and quote it off to you because they know those nine supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the church over here, you know what they got memorized? They got Galatians 5 memorized, and they can tell you the fruits of the Holy Spirit, also nine. Also nine. Nine fruits of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. You know, they can just rock it out. They know those, and they're focusing on these, right? And these people over here, they're focusing on that. And you got to have them both, right? You got to have it all together. You got to have this complete package all together. So let's say this. The churches over here, a lot of times, they will focus on programs, and they'll focus on doing stuff. And sometimes, I'll be honest, they do it in their own power because they're not plugged into the Holy Spirit, some of them. Hey, you know what? I know tongue-talking, spirit-filled Lutherans. I know tongue-talking, spirit-filled Catholics that are casting out demons and are going for it. I know people that are completely 100% sold out for God that you would think, if you, if you talk to them, they're from over here, but they're in this denomination, mainline denomination church, right? They're there, man. They're planted in there, right? So, but some of them, you know, maybe lots of them aren't. They don't have that revelation of the Holy Spirit. So they do things, and I'll call these, these people are, you know, they're operating in doing stuff, and they got programs, and, you know, but a lot of times they just don't have the power. They just don't have the power. And over here, it's usually about the experience. Come on, I'm just being honest. It's usually about the experience. It's about how good was worship today. Did I have tears coming down my eyes? Did I feel it? Was everybody jumping up and down? Was everybody clamping? Was everybody going for it, right? How good was it? When the people prayed, how many people got slain in the spirit? When this happened, how many miracles happened? When this happened, how did this all go? And it's all about the experience of the power. Now, bear with me. I'm generalizing. If this is offending you, I apologize. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but I have to kind of blanket it, right, just for time's sake. So generalizing, a lot of times over here, it's about the experience. It's about the power. Lots of times over here, it's about what we do. And then you got everything in between, right? So I'll give you a couple examples of what it looks like. I was going to church over here. We get married. My wife was atheist. Uh, God had me lead her to the Lord as a, as a, uh, it's a long story. So I had a girlfriend, a bartender girlfriend I'm dating. I tell her about Jesus. She accepts Jesus. We get married. And so we get married. And because she accepted Jesus, she wanted to start going to church. I'm like, cool, we go to church. So we're going to church and she starts working at the church. And I'm still smoking pot every day, all day long. I'm still partying. And she starts getting on me and on. And so we fought a lot for many years about all that stuff. But so it's this church that she's working in. We're over here. And um, I tell the pastor, yeah, okay, so I'm addicted to pot. You know, I sell drugs. I do all stuff. And I'm Coke and whiskey. And you know, that's my life. He's like, okay, well, well you know what? I'm going to meet with you. And we will counsel once a week until this is done. 
Two years goes by. Every, so we are church every Sunday morning, we're church every Wednesday night. Two years goes by and we meet Wednesday nights, an hour before service starts. So one hour a week, I did drug counseling with my pastor for two years. At the end of two years, I came in there one night, me and my wife come in, and I, something different was about the pastor. I, well, oh, I love this man. I love this man. Respect this man. But something was like, I immediately felt it when we came in. And he shuts a book, and he stands up, and he says to my wife, okay, we've been doing this for two years. I'm done. Divorce him. Leave him. Divorce him. Because you know what? This drug addict, he's not good enough for you and your kids. You don't deserve him. He is always going to be a drug addict. He is never going to quit. He is never going to quit. It's never going to stop. Just leave him right now. Just leave him right now. And I remember, I res I'm serious. I still love this man. I still respect him. And I looked up at him, and I believed what he said because I couldn't quit. In myself, I flushed my stuff so many times and go buy it the next day over and over and over. It's like, why am I wasting this money? God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Three days later, oh, I'm so nasty. I got to go buy an eight ball. Stay out in the garage, start up an eight ball. Wake up the next day, crazy headache, burning headache. Oh, man, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Two days later, go buy a half bag of weed. Two days later, get a bottle of whiskey. Oh, pour out a little bit to sleep the next morning. Oh, God, I'm sorry. Year after year after year. He's like, he's never going to stop. Look at him. Look at him. He's just gone for two years. He's never going to stop. Just leave him. Divorce him. So, thank God my wife didn't listen. So we walked out, and, and he said, I'm not meeting with you guys anymore. It's done. I'm done. What had happened? This is what had happened. He's from this church. He did everything he could in his own power. And he said, love, love him. For two years, he's telling her, love him, love him. I'm loving on him. But when you are not plugged into the power of God, sooner or later, you run dry. So I go to churches over here, and you know what happens? Sooner or later, if they're not plugged into the power of God, these churches are going to dry up. These churches are going to dry up sooner or later because we can't do it in our own power. And that's what happened. He dried up on me. The guy's love tank ran empty after two years. I would have, I would have quit on me. If I would have been him, I would have quit on me like after four or five months. This guy made it for two years, right? His love tank ran empty, right? So on this end of the spectrum, right? So what happened was how I got set free, these two missionaries came to my house and prayed for me and cast the demons off of me. It was supernatural. They operated in the gift of the word of knowledge. They said, you know, like she told me about the wife, told me about my past, said you were molested repeatedly. The only person in the world that knew Matt was my, was my wife. Nobody else in the world knew that. She said, you're, she told me what age I was, five or six years old, repeatedly molested. Nobody knew that. She says, the reason why you've been addicted to drugs all these years, counseling hasn't worked. Well, yeah, it didn't work. And she, all this stuff, and I went to secular counselors. It didn't work. She said, the reason why it hasn't worked is because it's a spiritual problem. you got demons on you. They were they attached you in your mom and dad's house. She told me about my mom. She told me about my dad. She was spot on. She said, you want to get done with it? We're going to pray for you. We'll kick these demons out of you and off of you and out of your house. So they did deliverance on me and my wife, and I was set free. So, see, that's the power, right? That's the power. And they were operating the power. In 10 years, nine, nine years of ministry, I've, I've see, in nine years of ministry, that I, I've gone to some of these churches, and they're no longer in existence. They've quit. They've closed the doors. Churches that I've been to in the last nine years, they've closed the doors because they dried up. You know what? Churches that are just focusing on the power, now hear me, just focusing on the power and just focus on what God's got over here, sooner or later, if they're out of balance like that, they're going to blow up. And there's a church split, and this happens, and that happens, and they blow up. So over on this end, they're going to dry up. If they stay stuck there, they're going to just dry up. If they focus on that alone, they're going to dry up. If they just focus on experiential, what the experience, what we feel, the power, just focus on this, they're going to blow up. You know what God wants? He wants us to come together and grow up. That's what the unity looks like. That's what the unity looks like. He's like, grow up, come on. Yeah, you don't have all the answers over here. No, you don't have all the answers over here. You got to get it together. Be a piece of the puzzle. Don't cut them down. Build them up. If you, don't, if you don't agree on a certain thing, just drop it. Don't fight about it. It's not salvation. It's not salvation. Just back away. Drop it, right? So that covers, like the, that, covers that part. But now here's another angle to it. What about in your church? What about in this church right now? So in this church. So we talked about you've got the nine supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's how you're empowered. You've got the nine fruits of the Spirit. And then you've got the gifts of the Father, right? So the nine supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit is how you're empowered. The gifts of Jesus in Ephesians, right? The gifts of 
the gifts of Jesus in Ephesians talks about what? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, those five. The five-fold ministry. That's your calling. What Jesus does for us, he gives us, those, it says that comes from Jesus, the five-fold ministry. That's your calling. So you get your calling from Jesus. You get your empowerment from the Holy Spirit. But here's the thing that everybody misses out. Most people get, don't get this. In Romans chapter 12, the gifts of the Father, it's your personality. The gifts of the Father are your personality. It's how you're wired. So you got the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, how you're empowered. You got the gifts of Jesus, what your calling is. But the big one, the gifts of the Father, it's how you're wired. It's your personality. So it says in the gifts, and, and I'm, because of time, I'm not going to read it. But Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8, it goes through your personality types. This is not your calling. This is not your gifting. This is your personality type. The prophet, the servant, the teacher, the exhorter, and encourager, the giver, the leader, the gift of mercy. So you've got these, you've got these uh, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You've got these seven gifts of the Father, which is your personality type. So in this church, let's focus on this church. In this church, there's people that have different gifts of spirit. There's people with different callings on the life, fivefold ministry, and the big one, there's all kinds of people with all these different personality types the Father's given them. And I've got it like this whole different, there's just like all these, oh man, it's so rich. There's so much here that I could talk about. But just, I'm just going to briefly do this as an example. Let's say Pastor Ken gets sick. Not speaking this over him, but let's just say he gets sick and he ends up in the hospital with a bellyache. So he's in the hospital with a bellyache, right? So he's at the hospital, he's got a bellyache, and the first one that shows up is somebody that has the personality of a prophet. So the personality of a prophet shows up in his room, he's all by himself, right? He's in there and he's rubbing his belly and he's in there laying in the bed. And the prophet shows up. And because of the way the prophet is wired, because of the way that their personality type is, the prophet says, Pastor Ken, it's not right. You shouldn't. They see black and white. Prophets see black and white. You shouldn't, be in the, you shouldn't be in this hospital. This is not right. Sickness is not for today. You're not supposed to be here. Prophets see other people's sin, and they see their own sin. They focus on that a lot. So maybe they're pretty soon they're like, this isn't right. You shouldn't be here. And they start thinking like, hey, Pastor Ken, you got some hidden sin in your life? Are you sick here in this hospital? Because you got a bellyache, whatever's going on here, because you got some hidden sin. Right then, right at that moment, right? So the door opens, the door opens, and right at that moment, somebody with the personality type of a servant, somebody with the, now this is from God. God wires people differently. The servant walks in, overhears what the prophet is saying, and says, hey, leave, leave Pastor Ken alone. What do you mean hidden sin is like, leave him alone. Pastor Ken, can I do anything for you? I'm a servant. Can I fluff your pillow? Can I go, can I go give you a glass of water? Can I fold your underwear? Is there, any, is there anything you want me to do? Anything that I can do? I'll do anything you want. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to serve you. I'll do anything that you want me to do. Now the prophet's a little offended, right? Come on. Prophet's a little offended. Like, whoa, wait a minute, right? So they're kind of standing back. They're kind of watching. And about that time, the teacher walks in. Teacher walks in and says, hey, prophet, back, back aside. Servant, back aside. You know what? I got the answers here. So, so, Ken, tell me exactly what's going on. What is the diagnosis of the doctors? Do we have a plan? Let's look this up on my iPad. Okay. Uh, let's see. You should probably have this kind of medicine. What does the word say? Have you, got, have you picked up a verse about this? Do you know what the verse we should, the specific verse that we're supposed to pray about this? Because it's all about the word. Teacher, it's all about the word. Come on. The teacher, it's all about the word. So we need to have some verses to go with this. To figure this out, and we got to, maybe we need to get a second diagnosis. We should just get a second. They're analytical. It's all about the word. They're teaching. They're talking, and they're pretty important. And they're telling what's going on. They're telling everybody to back away, right? And about that time, right, about that time, the encourager comes in. Now, encouragers, they're loud, man. They're usually boisterous, and they're telling jokes, and they're encouraging people, right? And they're telling stories, and they're like, teacher, back aside. So the encourager says, hey, Pastor Ken, you know, one time I had a bellyache, too. And, but, but you know what? Here it was. This was it, man. I ate too much cheese. I was just a little backed up. Pastor Ken, maybe you just need to use the bathroom, you know? Hey, it'll be fine. It'll be over in a little bit, man. It's going to be good, right? And he's loud and like, right now, the prophet's mad. Now, listen, think about this. The prophet's mad. The servant's mad. The teacher's mad. And about that time, the giver walks in. And the giver's got balloons and flowers and candy. And they're like, everybody move aside. And th there's that little tray. 
And they set down the flowers and they set down the candy and they set down the card and they start looking around and they go, wait a minute. I'm the only one that brought gifts? Are you kidding me? What's wrong with you guys? I'm the only one that brought, Ken, look at what I brought for you. Look what I brought for you, man. Do you like chocolates? Do you, do you like these flowers? They're pretty and, and, and the balloons and look, I got I engraved your name on it. All this stuff, right? And, and they're mad at everybody else because nobody else, what? Nobody else brought gifts? Are you kidding me, right? So they're a little bit upset, right? But then about that time, the door swings again. And the ruler walks in, those gifted and ruling, right? And the ruler's like, all right, everybody shut up. <laughs> this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. You, you call the insurance company, see how much deductible is. We're going to take care of it. You go home and feed his dog, feed his cat, all right? You go home and start making meals because his wife and the family, they need some meals, right? Right? You do this. You go get the taxi cab, get the limo. I mean, and the, the rulers tell them they're kind of a little bit bossy, right? And about that time, the prophet, he's like, what? And they're all like, they're all mad, right? And they're all just, everybody's mad. And the last one with the seventh personality type comes into the room, and it's the one with the gift of mercy. Throws himself across Ken's feet, laying in the bed. Cries, oh, Ken. I can't believe it. You're here in the bed. It's, I'm so, I hurt for you. Man, I hurt for you on the inside. It hurts so bad. I'm crying for you on the inside, Ken, on the outside too. Oh, it hurts. It hurts. Why aren't any of you crying? How come nobody else in this place is crying? And everybody's mad. And the prophet's like, stop crying. Right? And all of them are only doing what they were gifted personality-wise to do. But everybody's mad at everybody else. It happens in the church over and over because we don't see other people's giftings and we only look through the lens of what we've got because we're only personality type A, B, C, or D. You know what? Sometimes you're a mix. A little bit of this one, a little bit of that one. But you know what? It don't go much more than that. You know who you are. You know who you are when I just named those seven off. You know who your wife is. You know who your husband is. You know who your kids are. You know who your pastor is, right? And it causes, listen, it causes disunity and strife because we get in pride. And if I had the time, I'd read the verses. When, when he talks about the gifts of the Spirit, when he talks about the gifts of especially the personality, you know what, I'm just going to do it. I just got to do this. You got you to read this. You got to read this. In Romans 12 here, this is what he says. Before he goes, before he goes into this, verse 3 says, For by the grace given me, this is about the personality types. For by grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not, listen church, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you, just as each of us has one body of member members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many have one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So before it goes into, and it talks about the different giftings, the different personality types of the Father, it says first, don't look at yourself more highly than not. Be humble. Don't be in pride. Because he knows we have human nature, and he knows when we're gifted a certain way, when we're made a certain way, we look at everybody else, and they're wrong. Come on. That's, come on. That's human nature. Everybody else has to be wrong because I must be. I'm right, man. You guys just aren't looking at it right. You guys are all wrong. I've got all the answers, right? And each person, but here's the thing. If we look at other people and give them honor and lift them up, we can see the good. We can see the positive. And you can say, you know what? We need the giver. Great. The balloons are great, right? We need the person coming there doing the servant stuff and folding his underwear. We need the person that's going to come in and exhort him and lift him up and encourage him. We need the prophet that's going to say, you know what, pastor, we're praying for you. You don't belong here. You need to get healed. You need to get out of this place. We need all these things. And instead of getting on our high horse and thinking we're better or we've got all the answers, we got to say, everybody, let's just come together. Enough of the church infighting, and not the church backstabbing, and not the church, this is wrong and that's wrong. And we got to realize that God made us all and gave us a piece of the puzzle. We don't have the whole puzzle. We just got a piece. And we got to respect that and realize, oh, I just got a piece. And they might have a different piece, and it's totally different than mine. And I don't even see where they're coming from. But you know what? It's valid. And it's real. And if we don't all come together, something is missing. If we don't have, you know what? If the, the churches that kick out the prophets... It's missing. The prophet voice is missing in the church. All this stuff, it's got to it's gotta come together. And when we, can come to, when we can come together in unity, what's going to happen? Right? The world's going to know that God sent Jesus, and they're going to know that God loved them just as much, just as much as he, just as much God loves us and everybody just as much as he loved Jesus. 
That's what happens when we come to unity. But if we're in strife, if we're fighting, if we're backstabbing, if we're, I don't understand. Why do we have to have all those, why do we have to have that many songs? Why do we, you know, all this stuff that we fight about and bicker about and complain about and in churches, right? And all we do is cause strife and disunity. If we got it, if we get together and say, you know, I respect you, I honor you for who you are, for the way that God made you, right? Let me do one more thing. Let's say you guys, do you guys do mission trips here? Does church go on mission trips? Where's the next mission trip? Do we have one planned? Okay, so where was the last mission trip? Where was the last one? Was to Thailand. Okay, so let's say, um, let's say that you guys are going to go on a, uh, you went on this mission trip to Thailand, and you guys are going to plan this out. You're going to plan the mission trip out, and the prophet comes, and the prophet says, you know, um, we got to go speak to these people. This is, we're going to go on a mission trip. So you have like a, a Tuesday night planning meeting, right? You got a Tuesday night planning meeting. You're going to plan this mission trip out. And the prophet comes and says, hey, you know what? We're going to go down to Guatemala or wherever, and, and we're going to, you know, it's, it's about setting the captives free. It's about telling these people that they need to be set free. And, you know, somebody that shows up and, and somebody else has a different gifting, and it's the evangelist. Now, the fivefold giftings, right? The fivefold ministry. The evangelist says, no, 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 that's not what we're going to do. We're going to go to Guatemala. We're going to do crusades. Are you dumb? We're going to do, we're going to go and do crusades because we got to get this. We got to get the lost saved. Are you kidding me? And the teacher's like, no, no, no. You guys are both wrong. We're going down there. We're doing VBS because the people need to know the word. We're going to teach them the word. Come on, people. We need to teach them the word. It's all about the word. We're not doing crusades. We're not going to be like prophetically marching around the city. We're going to teach them. What we're going to do VBS. We're going to do this, right? And then the next person shows up and it's the apostle. And he's like, you guys are all wrong. We're going down there to build a church. Come on. We're building a church down there. And they'll start fighting about what they're going to do on the mission trip. Why? Because they've all got a different what? Calling. They all got a different calling, and they think that they're right and the other one's wrong, right? I've seen it on so many mission trips. I lead a mission trip at least a couple times a year, and I see it right in little small groups you bring, 15, 20 people, and they're mad. This one's mad at that one because we're supposed to be doing this. No, we're supposed to be doing that. Maybe we should do it all or do it a little bit this time, go back another time, do it that time, and just love on everybody and just let, just give somebody else honor. Give somebody else the chance, right? You see it? I could go on and on, man. There's pages. I could just go on and on. We got to, you know, what? We, amen. We got to love each other more. We got to, you know what we got to do? We got to walk in love and power. You got to have Galatians over here, five, right? We got to have the, the nine gifts of the Spirit. You, know, you, have, you have to have the nine, I'm sorry. You have to have the nine fruits of the Spirit over here in Galatians. And you have to have the nine gifts over here in Corinthians 12. So we got the power. We got the love. It comes together. We grow up. Let me just, can I, I know, look, I'm long-winded, man. I'm just saying it right now. I'm long-winded, okay? I apologize. Can I just end with one story? Okay, so I'm going to end with this story. This is what love and power looks like together. So we go on this mission trip. Okay, so I'll back up. We, uh, the reason why I wouldn't go into ministry is because of money. I made a lot of money in my job, my business, and I wasn't going to go into ministry. I, I wasn't going to do it. And so we, you know, the accident happened, and I finally say yes, and we, we had to give, you know, my, all my investments were gone. I, I didn't have workman's comp. I had 80-20 insurance. So in the States, that means the insurance company paid 80%. I paid 20%. My 20% was 400 and some thousand dollars. So all my savings is gone. All my investments are gone. My 401k, you guys have 401ks here? You have a retirement program. It's all emptied out. I lose everything. I got nothing because of the accident. I'm in the, I'm in the hospital for you. I lose everything. I got nothing at all. All I got left is the equity for my home. And because I had a financial issue with me, because I had a problem about money, God said, okay, now take the equity from your home, take it all, the last thing you got left in this world, and build orphanages in Honduras with it. And I'm like, get behind me, Satan. No way, right? God wouldn't tell me to do that. That's crazy talk. But he, it was God, and so we did it. And as soon as I gave the check, it was a large check. As soon as I gave this check and the guy had it, I start going into fear and I start freaking out and I'm going, oh no, I, I, did I just do that? That's insane. We got no money coming in. I'm in sick. I'm rehab. We've depleted everything. And the last little thing we had in the world, we just gave away. I got four kids. I got no money coming. I still owe hundreds of thousands of dollars. I didn't even was able to pay it off. What am I doing? I'm crazy. So then God tells me a word of knowledge and says, oh, and by the way, the people that you gave the money with to, to build the orphanages, a lot of it's going to get wasted, squandered, and they're stealing it down there. I'm like, what, God, why did you tell me to give it to him then? He said, it's a test for you and for them. 
oh, God, why, why? I don't want to be tested, right? So I freak out, and I'm like, that's it. I'm going down there. I'm going to Honduras, right? So I buy a plane ticket. It's in the middle of 2009 where there was a coup in Honduras. And they're burning buses, and they're shooting people, and they kick the president out. And the United States government says, U.S. citizens are not allowed to go to Honduras. He buys a ticket and goes to Honduras. I do, right in the middle of it all. We land the plane. There's a bus burning. People are shooting machine guns. Right as the plane is landing, I see it all, right? I'm like, it's all about my money. It's all about my money, right? So we're going up in the people. They are guilty. They're, they know. I said, hey, I know what's going on here. They knew. I knew. They started, well, we don't want you here, so just go preach. Hope you brought preaching clothes. So they, stay, they hooked me up to preach. So I'm going up preaching all over, preaching all over, right? So I'm up one, one day on, the, on a mountaintop, out on this mountaintop. We park the Jeep. We walk for 45 minutes. We get in this village on a mountaintop. It's the only place, the first, the first time, it's the first time in my life I'd actually seen what it looks to see children starving to death with my own eyes. I'd, I'd seen it on movies or, you know, TV and, you know, stuff on TV, documentaries, but I'd never seen it with my own eyes. When a child is about to die because they're starving to death, they're real skinny, but their belly distends. It sticks out like a beer belly because their intestines get all twisted and knotted up, and that's right before death. I mean, it, it's pretty close, right? And so there's kids running around naked, and their bellies are sticking out, and they're like little twigs, and people are wearing rags. Like, literally, they've got rags wrapped around their bodies. It's like, in my own life, the, the poorest conditions I've ever seen, right? So we go, and we preach, and it was this little, little tiny church on a mountaintop, and we get down, the pastor says, it was a female pastor, and she says, hey, on the way back to the Jeep, can we walk a different way? I want you to pray for a local prostitute. And I said, sure, great, no problem. What's the deal? She said, well, this pastor used to come to my church. Now, third world countries, what I love about third world countries is this. They are open to things of the spirit. The reason why is because, you know what, like I just had a friend that's in Haiti right now. And this friend in Haiti had never seen this before. Somebody in, their, in her little town just got cursed by a witch doctor, and three days later, they died. Perfectly healthy person is dead three days later after the witch doctor, somebody pays the witch doctor to curse them. They didn't get shot. They didn't get poisoned. They died. Supernaturally, in the spirit realm, something happened, right? And the person's like, I didn't think it really happened that powerful. It's like, yeah. And these people in Africa, these people in third world countries, they know that the spirit realm is it's real, man. They know it's real. And so third, you know, third world nations are ahead of us in the fact of, of recognizing the spirit realm. So this prostitute had her bases covered. She was into witchcraft. She was into animus, you know, animal sacrifices. She's into Santa Maria, which is a cross between witchcraft and Catholicism. She's got her, you know, that's what they do a lot of times. What they don't tell you when Reinhard Bunke goes and or somebody does a big crusade in Africa and a bunch of people raise their hand to do Jesus, lots of times they're adding Jesus to the list. That's, I've been there. I've talked to it. They're adding it to the list. Yeah, okay, I'm going to cover my bases. It's real. I believe that Jesus is real. I'm going to cover my base. I want Jesus. But, you know, maybe I'm still going to do this, and maybe I'm still going to have that too, right? That's what you find out when you've been in these places, and you talk to them. They're covering their bases. So this prostitute came into church, and she was, you know, she was like the head prostitute for the village, I guess. And she's at church, and every once a month, they give away a bag of beans and a bag of rice. They give this bag of beans the bag of rice and because the people are starving to death. And this comes from the United States, comes from a ministry out of Minnesota, and they send it to them, and... Every time it came time to get out the beans and rice, the prostitute would butt to the front of the line to be the first in line. And the pastor rebuked her one day and said, uh, you know what? You need to stop it. Every time you're butting to the front of the line, just the back, back to the back of the line. You're no better than anybody else. And the prostitute says to the pastor, oh, yeah? I'll have you killed. Don't insult me like that in front of these people. You're dead. In Honduras, there is no police. It's the army. That's what the police is. It's the army. And so if, I mean, when you're there, there's checkpoints on the roads, but Every time I go there, I see people killed. I mean, people laying there, bleeding out, shotguns. I mean, there's every gas station has a dude with a shotgun at the cash register because if they're going to protect that money, they got to do it themselves, right? And so, I mean, it's just, it's mass chaos. Actually, like murder capital, that whole area, it's the funnel. All the drugs have to come through in Central America. So the, the drugs are crazy there. The drug gains are crazy there. So anyway, it's a very dangerous, dangerous area. Very dangerous. So we're there, we're seeing this happen. The prostitute could actually get the pastor killed. It's, it's feasible, and the pastor knows it. Well, a, it's been a year. It's been like a year, and right after, the, right after the prostitute made this threat to the pastor, the prostitute became paralyzed from here down. So right after the, past, the, pr right after the prostitute uh, threatens the pastor's life, she becomes paralyzed from here down. Now there's a message right there about coming against the Lord's anointed. And if you pay me 50 bucks, I'll preach that message. <laughs> so 
she's paralyzed from here down. And so the pastor's like, let's go pray. Because she'd already seen a bunch of miracles happen. And this pastor's thinking, read between lines, if the prostitute gets healed, I won't have to worry about the death row. See it? So we go there. There's a hut, four posts with two sheets of corrugated tin that's the roof, no walls. It's 100 degrees. It's like 100% humidity. Just standing there, you're sweating, you're drenched, right? And now we're walking up and down mountains, literally mountains, right? So we're soaked. There's a bed in the back. It's a homemade bed. It's made out of two by fours. There's a mattress on it. She's laying in the bed all the way to the back. It's the only wall, other three open walls. It's a rock floor, and the, the sheets of tin have been taken off of something else. I mean, I remember there was a red shoelace holding one corner together. I mean, it's just like the shack, right? That's her house. It's her hut. She's still in business. That's how she eats, man. She's laying there in the bed. She's in business. She lays there. That's her job, right? So I'm not trying to be gross. This is where it was going on. So she has a, a, a bucket laying up, up, up against the side of the bed, and that's the potty. That's the bathroom. And the smell was, even with open everything, the smell was so bad. And I'm like, I'll admit, I'm a germaphobic guy, right? I'm germaphobe. And it was so bad. It was like, oh, my God. Oh, God, please, this is, I can't take this. The smell is so bad, right? And she had what I'll call a, a onesie on. When my little girls used to have, be little, they'd wear these cotton one-piece onesies, just a, a sleeveless cotton dress, right? And so she's got a dark blue cotton dress that is stained and stiff with blotty fluids. And I, I look at the whole situation, and I'm like, my skin is crawling. I'm going, oh, God, no. Like, and so we got to go up and talk to her and everything, and I'm like, oh, I just want to hold my breath. And I'm saying, get this bucket out of here. Get the, move the bucket out for now, right? So they get the bucket out, and I have to talk to the interpreter. And we had just left the orphanage, and all the little girls' heads were shaved. And all the little boys' heads were shaved. And I'm like, why did you shave the girls' heads? And like, the lice are so bad this year. The lice epidemic is so bad that we can't stop it, so we just have to shave everybody bald. And they said, when you're ministering to people, when you're ministering to people, they're going to want to hug you. And if they hug you, be careful that their hair doesn't touch your hair, because if you rub hair to hair, the eggs will get, and you'll get, You'll get lice because most of the people that come on the trips this year have been getting lice. Just warn you. It's going to probably happen. Don't rub heads. So I'm freaking out. Like, man, I don't want to rub anybody's head, right? You know? And I'm just, I'm freaking out. So we come in and we stand over and I talk to her about Jesus. And I'm telling her, look, you can't have Jesus as one of your gods. He's got to be all or nothing. It's either you're all in for Jesus or forget it. Now, do you want us to receive Jesus or what? Has the witchcraft helped? Has the voodoo helped? Has the animal sacrifices helped? You're still laying in the bed. You're still paralyzed. Like, well, wake up, lady. So she's like, all right, I'll do it. Just Jesus. I'm like, are you, you really want this? Because I'm not going to twist your arm. You really want him? Just him. She's like, yeah. So we lead her through the prayer. She received Jesus. So, you know, they say when you're on your back, the only place you have to look is up, right? She's desperate, right? So she's laying there, and I said, you know, okay, we're going to pray for your physical infirmity, whatever it is, right? So she can move her arms, but she can't move from here down. She's just laying there, like I said, you know, I'm, so it says in Mark 16, those who believe will lay their hands. I'm going, God, please, I don't want to touch her, Lord. Lord, I don't want to touch her, and I know you're telling me i got to touch her. Please, God, don't make me touch her. He's like, no, you got to put your hands on her. So I'm thinking the safest place to touch this woman is right on her neck so I don't touch her hair because she had, like, shoulder-length black hair. And so I slip my fingers in there, and I just touch, like, the, the, the like right here, right? And I'm like, real careful not to touch anything else. And I got my hands on her like that. And I'm leading her through the prayer, and I'm praying against the sickness. And all of a sudden, her head was, as she was laying in the chair, her head was on this end, and her head was twisted. That was part of the other thing, too. She could move, but her head had been, for whatever reason, cocked off to the side. And as I started to pray, the power of God went out, and her head snapped straight. And when it did, her eyes popped open. And the Lord said to me, she's 100% healed. Tell her to get up. Well, the girl that's my interpreter was a 19-year-old girl from Minnesota who was from this church over here. Okay, And I say to her, I said, tell her to get up right now. And she looks up with these big scared eyes, right? And she looks down and she shakes her head. No, I said, tell her to get up right now. And she goes, uh, in, in Spanish, tells her to get up. But she says it real quiet. And I said, no, yell. Tell her to get up out of the bed. God's healed her. Tell her to jump up right now. So she says it. She barks it out. This prostitute jumps up and she's standing at the side of her bed. And she goes into shock, which when we see the big miracles happen, a lot of times the people go into shock. And she's just looking down at her legs. And she can't believe her legs are working. And she's just looking at herself, and she ain't do nothing. I'm like, I'm getting out of here. I can't stand the smell. So I run away, and I'm like way back, right? And I'm just watching it from a distance. And the people from the church are all happy, and they're all like high-fiving and praising God and stuff. And I'm watching, and the woman is not happy. And I'm like, God, okay, 
this is the first time I've ever seen you do a paralyzed person get up and walk straight out of the Bible, and she's not even happy. God, why? Why isn't she happy? And the Lord, the Holy Spirit speaks, and he says, she doesn't know how much I love her. So what happened? She got the what? She got the power, but she didn't even know God loved her. She's just standing there, right? She's in shock. And he said, you go back in there. You put your hands on her and just pray that the, that the veil is lifted off her spiritual eyes so she's able to receive my love. So I hold my breath. I run in there. I grab her by the side of the head, and I just like, you know, and I'm praying, you know, like, bam, she goes down. Oh, cold. And I run back out. And I stand back over here, and she's laying there like, you know, head against the rock, no catcher, like, bam, she's down. And I'm just watching her, like, 10 minutes goes by, and she started, her eyes start rolling around her head, pointing the wrong way, and she comes up off the floor. And I'm watching her, and she starts crying. I'm thinking, wait a minute, I prayed she should be happy, right? And she's crying. I'm thinking, did she hit her head on the rocks that hard, or you know what? You know, and I'm just kind of watching. The Lord said, when somebody receives me and they receive my love, they really receive my love, they have godly sorrow for their sin. Come on, if you've never received experience, experienced godly sorrow for your sin, there's something missing. She's crying about her sin. And she calls the pastor over, and I call the, the, the interpreter. I said, tell me, what are they saying? What are they saying? And she's saying, I'm sorry. She's telling the pastor, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and they, and I'm sorry. And they're talking, they're talking. So I'm like, oh, yeah. And all of a sudden, she starts, her countenance is changing, and she's getting happier and happier and happier. And I'm like, yeah, no, that's what I'm talking about, right? Paralyzed person receives Jesus, gets healed from being paralyzed, and now she's repenting of her sin. Now she's happy, and everybody's hugging everybody. I'm like, right on, God, that's cool. That's the way it should be. And she's hugging everybody, and all of a sudden, she turns and looks at me. And I see that look, and she's like, I'm like, I said, no, God, no, no, God. And so I did the only thing I could did. I said, Alicia, I said, go give her a big hug, the interpreter. So I sent her and I'm saying, God, no, please, please don't make me, please don't make me hug her. And he said, Bruce, did I send you to be my hands? He said, yes, Lord. He said, did I send you to be my feet? He said, yes, Lord. He said, did I send you to be my mouthpiece? He said, yes, Lord. He said, go and hug her like I'd hug her. I'm like, no, Lord, please, no, no. He said, go hug her like I'd hug her. So I get a plan. I decide, okay. I can do this. I can do this. I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. I can do this, right? And I, I'm going to take a big breath. I'm going to hug her and run out before I have to breathe. So I take in this big, deep breath, and I run in there to give her a hug, and right then the Holy Spirit says, by the way. Now, anytime the Holy Spirit says, by the way to me, I'm getting taken to the woodshed, if you know what I mean. And he says, by the way, when Jesus reached out his hand to touch the leper, he wasn't afraid of getting leprosy. And I realized I was afraid of getting the lice. I was afraid of the smell. I was afraid of all stuff. And it hurt so bad because God's word is a mirror. And it shows us what's in our heart. And it hurt so bad spiritually, inside, emotionally, that I physically breathed out. And I went, oh. And now I'm right, right next to her. And I have to breathe in. And I breathe in and it's like, oh, goodness sakes. And so he said, you know, I want to do the old distance, you know, the old Christian he's hug. Oh, hey, praise the Lord and get out of there. But he said, no, you got to hug her. He's like, you got to hug her the way I'd hug her. So that meant like, you know, full on, right? So, man, I get up there, and I wrap my arms around her. I'm giving her this big old hug, and mm, cheek to cheek we go, right? And it's cheek to cheek, and I got to take in a breath, right? Because I'm holding as long as I can, but I got to breathe, and I go. And I take in a breath, and all of a sudden, there's nothing there. And I go, and I'm like, I go. <laughs> I'm like sniffing her like, whoa, 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 whoa. I know she's a source of so all this smell. Where'd it go? And I'm like, I'm in shock. I know I'm in shock. And I walk away, scratching my head. And the Lord said, you just smelled her with my nose. And she's not stinky. He said, she's not stinky to me. Sin is what makes you stinky. And he said, Bruce, here's where the rebuke came. He said, Bruce. You came in power, but you didn't have love for that woman. You didn't love her. You didn't love her. You came in power and the miracle happened, but you didn't love her. Operate in love and power, Bruce. And if we operate in love and power, then things happen, right? You know what? East Hastings in Vancouver, anybody been there? The crazy big homeless area, right? People I know that I've ministered there and people I know that minister there repeatedly, you know what they say about the smelly, the homeless people? They don't smell it. 
don't smell it after years. It doesn't, you know, they don't have any kind of smell, any kind of issue, right? And, and I'm just saying that uh, it's, it's a spiritual thing that turns into physical, right? So let's just pray. God, thank you that you love us. God, if there's anybody here that doesn't know your love, if there's anybody here that doesn't have that salvation gift from you, we just lift them up to you. You said you draw all men and women unto yourself. So I just pray, Lord God, you draw anybody in here this place right now that doesn't have you, that you draw them in. We lift them up to you. We pray that your power and your love, God, we pray for unity in the church, unity in this body and the other bodies. But right here, right now, this place, Lord, if there's anybody that doesn't know you, Lord, we lift them up to you. And you know what? If that's you, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, the stuff I'm talking about sounds crazy to you, but you know in your heart, there's a witness in your heart that it's real. It says that God draws people, and he's like knocking on your door right now. And if that's you and you want to have a relationship with him, you want to receive him to be your Lord and Savior, to wash away your sins, because we're all sinners. We're all, we all got that stink of sin. But then when we ask for repentance, we repent and ask for forgiveness, that stinky sin is washed away, and all God smells is that clean robe of righteousness, right? And if you want that clean robe of righteousness today, I'm going to count to three. Could I have every head bowed and everybody closed? Every head bowed and everybody closed. You're feeling a tug in your heart. You want that robe of righteousness? Today's the day of salvation. God's calling you. Jesus died for your sins. He rose again to conquer sin, death, and devil. He's here. He's alive and well. He's a miracle worker. If that's you, you want to receive him as your Lord and Savior, not for fire insurance, but to have intimacy with him, relationships, so you can have that love, the love that the prostitute experienced, right? the love that I've experienced, and I don't deserve it. If that's you and you want that love, you want to receive that relationship on the count of three, just raise your hand right right. Okay, for the 10 people that had your hands up, and for everybody else, you just repeat after me. Just say this. If you're a Christian, great. Just repeat it with us. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. I've sinned against you and other people. But this day I receive your forgiveness. I receive your love. I pray that you would be my Lord, my Savior, that we would have intimacy, relationship from this day forward. Thank you that you died on the cross for my sins, but you rose again. I pray that I would have forever with you and eternity with you in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Can we give Jesus a clap? Again, so church, God's calling you unity. You've been looking down on somebody else because they're different than you. Think about they're just wired different than you, right? Embrace them, honor them, and God will bless you for it.